And the idea of a living prophet heading to church, I don't believe that concept is even in the scripture. The idea of um, the, a Melchizedekian who, who priesthood. But Quake, who can I ask you, do you believe that two men being married is a valid marriage in the sight of God? Yes, disqualified, disqualified because, because the LDS, LDS concept, concept of God, God constitutes, constitutes idolatry. idolatry. But uh, so, for example, uh, yeah, can you guys tell me the state? Of the student body that are supposed to be the Mormon student body at BYU, because our perception as outsiders, it is decidedly untied to historical Mormonism and embracing various confusing, confusing strands of sort of progressivist thought that are infusing the the Mormonism that they're holding to and turning it into something else. And that seems like that's potentially the future of the church. I What's your see, reading on the situation? I could see your perception of that, especially because I, I think some of those voices are the loudest. Um, yeah. But yeah. there's there's pretty mixed levels of belief. You, you have all sorts of believers at BYU. You have some who are more in the progressive mindset. You have some who are less. Um, I, I don't think that it's an accurate representation of the direction that the church would be going. I, I think any place, it's a place for learning. Yeah. You should be able to give some you know headway for people trying to understand. and Young make, people. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I do think not all that glitters is gold. The media tries to make it out like it's uh, some progressive Mormon hotspot. 90% of the student body is conservative Orthodox LDS. And, you know, just because it's on TikTok doesn't yeah. mean, you know, I got some buddies well, that make some progressive I've heard Mormon about TikTok this. Uh, what is that group on Black campus Nises? that some upstart used to lead? The uh, the Young Democrats or something? Oh, BYU's <laughs> BYU Democrats? Dems? When, when yeah. Quaker was Apostates. Oh, yeah, gotcha. well, what's the... No, what actually What's when the, I was when I was head of BYU Dems, it was a freaking good club. We were doing stuff to help refugees. We were pretty in line with the good stuff. When I left, it got a little murky. But let me tell you, dang good leader. <laughs> okay, Obama. <laughs> so I was so, mostly, uh, I was and, mostly and, dedicated and, to refugees and, and Obama, vocab. So. Vocab. Yeah. Uh, it, with that as your example, Kwaku has swung pretty far to the right since. No, well, no, he's no, got to no. be on Mormon social media. Political. I've rejected all political. He doesn't want to stay in the Sunstone corner. <laughs> I was never in Sunstone. I've never. What's yeah, that? but but he's pretty much abandoned the progressivism. So I mean, even if you're seeing people on TikTok who are pretty progressive while at BYU, they a they don't represent the majority, and b plenty of those are going to change as soon as yeah, they and leave. half of them are teenagers. Like yeah, they're wh- figuring it out. Why? Why is and I'm not talking about you, but why is anti Mormon media obsessed with trying to pigeonhole a bunch of eighteen year olds who's still trying to figure out who they are? Like, it's crazy to me that you see Dylan and these people hold their humanity against them. Well, that's it's, just it's me. Like, okay, yeah, so your that. opinion let, let of the book, The Next Mormons. So, sorry, so what? The, your, do you guys have an opinion? If not, it's of the book, The Next Mormons by Jana Rice, how millennials are changing the LDS church. Oh, it's a book on Reese. Oxford Press, I, I 2019. Do actually, I, I do. So Jana Rice has a lot of um stuff that she's trying to do that I think could be really interesting if she had a better set of data. So she has some pretty low end studies that she's basing a lot of her assertions off of. So when she's saying with like the next Mormons, I did these studies and these are the Mormons I talked to and this represents what they're going to be like, you got to understand that her studies just really don't hold up. And and, and I think it it's, needs to be it needs to be said that in the in LDS theology there's a there's a very wide breadth uh, a spectrum of belief. You can you can believe a lot of things. You can be a progressive Mormon. You can be a conservative Mormon. You can be, you know, a Buddhist and a Mormon. I mean, we don't ask anybody to reject their Catholic faith or their Calvinist faith when they join the church. You can believe all kinds of things. And God's uh, uh, Joseph Smith famously said, what? no one was ever damned for believing too much. You can believe all kinds of things. You yeah. can be El- progressive. Elder Uchtdorf famously said, Bring what you have, we'll add on to it. No, but but I think what vocab's getting Hinkley here is... Uh, oh, really? Yeah, it's Hinkley. No, guys, the, just because somebody is figuring out the truth doesn't mean that they don't have unchristian, secularized ideas to shed. 
And I think what he's saying is based off of a lot of the publications and the media coverage of BYU. Yeah. It seems like it's going woke, which is something we complain about on our show. All the time. Now, uh, all we're here to do is disabuse you of the narrative that it's a majority and tell yeah. you that it's less than one tenth of one percent. And, and Jenna Reese. Is, well, wait, I mean, but how, I hear what you're saying, but do you have a different sample size that she doesn't have access to? Do you really know what you're that? I mean, yeah, you may feel it anecdotally. This, this is no, this is the birthplace of our channel, Midnight Mormons, is traditionally it used to be the anti-Mormonism growing up in the 80s and 90s was almost always sectarian. It was some pastor that wrote a book like The God Makers. If in when I was a young kid in elementary school, if your mother said, um, that person is an anti-Mormon, it always meant they were a sectarian Christian that didn't like Mormon theology. Nowadays, if you say, oh, that guy's an anti-Mormon, the well-known colloquial understanding is that they're an ex-member of the church who's adopted atheism and secularism and is now using woke ideology in order to try and launch cry bully bombs against the church. And those are 90% of our debunkings are actually woke cry bully bombs that have been lobbed at the church from ex-member atheists. But they are the extreme minority. And, and, and I will say that Jana Reese herself is a pretty progressive LDS. She's, she's not. She's, under, she's, she's by most no means people don't objective. even know if she's active oh, yeah. or not. Oh, she, yeah. She's not objective. She's like a, an LDS person who actively tells people that paying their tithing isn't necessary. They could just pay it to a charity. And I would instead. say 90% of Mormons don't know who she is. Yeah. Like, like yeah, she's, she's almost no one. Well, knows. Oxford like, knows who she is. Who does? Oxford. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm she, just saying the she, book is published in Oxford. In woke it's, academic yeah, yeah, I mean, circles. I, I, I mean, I, I, my point Saints is that it's it's not like she's irrelevant. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's published by Oxford. But I could I mean. find a woke Calvinist pastor that wants there to be gay pastors in uh, Calvinist churches. That's not hard. You could find a woke Presbyterian, but not a woke Calvinist that would want you're gay marriage. But there's I, not I, a woke Calvinist my, in America who's published my point. My point by saying is, I'm not necessarily denying what you're saying. All I'm, I'm saying, saying is that it's, it's not like she's irrelevant. She's irrelevant. You know, it's, it is on Oxford. I'm not saying that makes it right. I'm just saying, understand. But I hear what you're saying. Okay, in relationship to that, what's your guys' view? My guess is you'll say it's all overblown and a misunderstanding of the 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 Respect for Marriage Act, which repealed DOMA and the LDS Church uh, giving support for it. Are you guys with that decision? Do you think that was the right decision, the wrong decision? Is it a misunderstanding from outsiders? I haven't read the act. I, haven't read the act, so I won't comment. Yeah, I was about going to say, I, we believe in being subject to kings and principalities and in what's called upholding and sustaining the law. So we also... <clears throat> but it wasn't law yet, just a clarification. It wasn't law yet. They came and supported it prior to it being law. Exactly. From what I understand, they supported an early version and an early draft that carved out simultaneous religious protections for those that didn't believe in it and simultaneous housing and employment and uh, hospital visitation and tax protections for those that already had existing state sanctioned marriages. And we were trying to give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and give unto God that which is God's, just as Jesus Christ said believers should do secondary and tertiary versions obviously went through different drafts and revisions and what the church endorsed may not have been what was passed, but we definitely try and take the commission of Christ of supporting, yeah. uh, giving unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and giving unto God's that which is God's. It was not a tacit endorsement of a uh, gay marriage or of the state or anything. We're just trying to give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and give it to God that which is God's. Yeah. Okay. So, so what's, what's your, your thought, thought back, back in 2008, when the church actively campaigned against gay marriage by supporting Prop 8. Do you see a difference in the approach on an official level? Because yeah, we actually know, but there was a huge did an difference. Episode on this. Yeah, um, I'm a California. Right. That's why I'm asking you. That's why I'm asking you. Yeah, what do you believe the, the Prop 8 uh, activity shows a difference now with respect for marriage support? Yeah, there's a huge difference because they were advocating for religious protections in the most recent legislation that did not exist in Proposition 8. Had Proposition 8 passed as it was written, 
it would have nullified the 501c3 tax status of the church. Not nullified it immediately, but it would have resulted in a logical set of dominoes that could lead to the nullification of the 501c3 status of the church, making it no longer a charitable institution, making our tithing no longer a charitable tax deduction. Of and, any church. Um, that, and of yeah. any church that didn't do church-sponsored gay marriages. One of the biggest complaints of what was now, it was then the most expensive measure ever run in American politics. I think it was $63 million after all of the receipts came in were put into that one measure alone. One of the big, biggest criticisms I um, heard from other opponents of the law were we they thought it was poorly written in a way that could strike that fear into the heart of religious people. Unlike previous acts and measures that have been passed concerning domestic partnership. Generally, most Mormons have no problems with domestic partnership laws because they don't threaten religious 501c3 uh, status. Now, this is all legalese that I can tell you um, is inaccessible to most people, but those two situations were different. They were different in small ways, but on very large doors can swing on small hinges. So you see, uh, looking from the outside and the trajectory uh, of the Mormon church to, to, uh, to a lot of us seems to be going swinging One of those laws was way. three pages long. One of them was one sentence long. It makes sense that I the church would be a little bit <laughs> and, more willing to accommodate vocab, a three page law than a one sentence law. And, and vocab, did you see what the church's actual statement was on this? Yeah, I got the, I got the article up. Uh, said, in regards in regards to the the recent thing, yeah, yeah, the federal yeah, the law. First sentence is that our position on marriage and temple ceremonies will not change. It's well known. Yes. It will not change. So that that's what that's what said. That's what said in relationship to this. Oops, sorry, my audio. That's what said in relationship to this. But here's what's interesting to us again. You may say it's unthinkable, but because of a canon that's not closed and continuing revelation via prophets, living prophets in charge. You can't, no one can guarantee what will or won't be said in the future of official Mormon doctrine and proclamations. Can yeah, I, 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 I would answer that by saying this um, as, as someone who isn't really, like, I, I tend to avoid this subject really because I, I feel like it, uh, you know, I, I just, it's not my favorite subject to talk about. However, if we're to talk about changing marriage doctrines in our church, our church has sustained man and woman in, in two different forms. Okay. Yeah, man and woman and woman and woman and woman and woman. Singular. That's but it. American Christianity and Protestantism has adopted same sex marriage by multi denominations. So I don't exactly know why we're. One's on the chopping block when it's like you a lot of you like that. Well, okay, Quaku, does that mean I can't ask you questions no, about the Elias to Church to position? A end. If I understand you correctly, I want to steal man. Well, your no, position. my point is though the, the the closed canon has still resulted in 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 you know a, a, a solo scriptura and sufficiency yeah. has that resulted. didn't really prevent it. Yeah, there's been more sola scriptura closed canon Christian churches that ad have adopted gay marriage. Than our open canon has. So that's, well, if, see why if, that's whenever the, you that's the catalyst for it. That was why the United Methodist Church broke up is because they're giving females mm -hmm. the priesthood and they're endorsing uh, a homosexual pastors. And whenever and you look and, at the people who support the things you're talking about, they're not citing the sufficiency of Scripture, and that's not something they hold to. They don't hold that Scripture alone is the determining authority. So Otherwise, they would never come to the this problem conclusion. Isn't the nature of the closed or no? But I'm saying they don't hold. Yeah, they finish, don't, that's not finish. what they hold to. No, that's why they they have signs that say things like God is still speaking no, today. Like, I, have trying, you ever seen that sign on the United Church of Christ? They do not believe in a, in, in that really in the way you're saying because they don't even believe that the canon was really ever closed in a way that matters anyway. If, that's why they say things like canon churches can adopt gay marriage and females in the priesthood. And your criticism is that our open canon leaves us vulnerable to that possibility of wokeness. To me, the nature of the canon being open or closed is not the issue. It's the nature of the hearts of the people. And we actually have found so far that having a modern prophet has been a bulwark against wokeism because it has less 
interpretation of scripture mingled with the precepts of men as a vulnerability. Now, your logical uh, conclusion is correct. If we have an open canon, just like Peter, upon praying on his roof, received the revelation of the unwashing animals coming down in the sheet, thus indicating that now we're no longer going to preach the gospel just to the Jews and we're going to now go out to the Gentiles. If you really wanted to go there, you could say taking that open canon and the modern prophets to its logical conclusion, you could see a possibility of a prophet coming out and saying, oh, we're going to religiously legalize this now. The huge problem in that reasoning, though, is that same logical conclusion could say, well, the Mormon church is vulnerable to legalizing, let's say, euthanasia, doctor-assisted suicide. Well, let me tell you, in all three dispensations, the Old, the New Testament, and the Restored Church, prophets have said no to homosexual marriage especially in the temple ceremony. So using the collective witness model of all three dispensations, I personally extremely doubt that will ever happen in the same way that in all three dispensations of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the restored church, our prophets and leaders have said life is sacred. We're not going to legalize abortion anytime soon either. Well, I, ho- I mean, I hope all those things are true, of course. I, I think it'd little, be um, better for us to, to say and this uh, this is a, you know, I, I feel like we should say this just because I want to value everyone's humanity here. And I know there are going to be people that are watching this that are gay. Um, I do feel like sometimes in this in this discussion about homosexuality and the church, and I, I, I'm quoting people who've told me this face to face, gay people often feel like they're being used as a pawn in, in certain sectarian fights. And I want to make sure that if anyone's watched this, they don't they know that's not what we're trying to do. I. I personally, personally do not want to see the the legal rights of anyone taken away. I personally, speaking yeah. as Kwaku, do not want to see the government go in and, and break up marriages, whether they're there are. We heterosexual want to see less governmental intervention, yes, not yes, more. Yes, yes. I, and I don't also I want to make clear I don't condone any sort of attack or bullying or anything like that to those who are gay. Because I know people will be watching, and I do, I do think sometimes that needs to be made clear with the. Yeah, yeah ju- just like yeah, my sure. reference to doctor assisted S word, it, right, it yeah. does not mean it is not meant to be a political football for families that might be struggling with that situation. But I think. Well, do you think two men who are married is actually a valid marriage in the sight of God? I I think that that's a question that doesn't really necessarily matter at this point because it's something that's becoming part of the state, right? Where. The state I, stole marriage, saying, bro. Like well, it's like if somebody said, do you think Southern uh, plantation owners can actually own people? And and do you think God is okay with that? We wouldn't say, I hope. I don't think that question really matters because it's legal in the South. We would say, well, no, and, and, get that get that out of here. I just made that preface because I, as, as someone who's black and straight, okay, even though some of the comments say I'm not okay, black and straight, I don't think. Well, this is where I kind of feel that Athanasian Creed hinders these guys. Well, listen, let's make this clear because sometimes we forget on this subject we're talking about people. We're not just talking about concepts. So, like, we we do need to, as humans, make I don't think we should compare slave owning and gay marriage. Okay. I I don't think. Wait, wait, no, 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 no. Okay. And I know that Uh, you're not, but some people will think that way, which is why making that clarification. But Quake, who can I ask you, do you believe that two men being married is a valid marriage in the sight of God? I believe the only valid marriage is eternal marriage. Which, which, how would you define eternal marriage? And eternal marriage is, is the union of a man and a woman be able to create spirits, children in the next life. Can two now, men I, I, create spirit children in any life? No, two no. men cannot, that, and two and, women And that's cannot. what's part of our theology there, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. No, I know that. No, I'm, not, I'm not here to, to say, though, that uh, we should use them as pawns in the discussion or try to break up their legal bindings or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah, I don't and we're that. also very careful to say that your state-sanctioned marriage in the eyes of the state that has unified you in a marriage the state accepts is a different thing. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. than the one, as you say, in the eyes of God. Because no matter what a Calvinist believes is valid in the eyes of God or what a Mormon believes is valid in the eyes of God, that's all different than what the state of California or the state of Arizona has chosen is value is valid in the eyes of Caesar. 
Yeah. So we're just trying to be extremely sensitive about how we word this because one of the big lessons that was learned during Prop 8 and one of the worst gross emotional leverages that was applied against Christians was talk shows like this getting clipped and getting sent out saying, look, those people want to take away your rights and want to take away your state sponsored marriage. We well, you guys be, don't have to air this part if you don't want to. That's fine with me. No, it's, it but has I, to I mean, be I talked about though. The hairs have to be split. It, it's an important thing for people to discuss. I yeah, think. and we can discuss, but and and we can also clarify because again, we're still talking about real people, and I think sometimes we forget. It's like when we talk about the A word, the A B ocean word, right? Sometimes we focus a lot on the babies. We still forget like there may be a woman in the congregation who has had. An abortion, right? Well, and, and I it's think it's good to remember the humanity of the vocab. Vocab's question is a really good one. What he's getting at is, if you don't have a closed canon, how can you how can you guarantee anything? And that's a very valid question. That's a very good question. And you and know, then I would just say, how is having a closed closed canon guaranteed the the, the same protections ooh. against uh, uh, wokeism by the closed canon folks? Because there's more closed canon churches going woke than there are open canon churches going woke. So you would just ask me a question instead of answering the question? Uh, no, I, I would just say I, I doubt the open or closed nature of the canon is the issue. I'd say I'd say it's the strength of the testimony in the hearts of the people and, that is the question. And I would say the, the canon is not as concrete as you think it is. There's 10 bajillion different interpretations of the exact same canon, and there's not nearly as many different spinoffs of, of modern open canon Mormonism. And, and as something are. that's interesting with... Well, you're younger than us, but I went to Missouri... And I saw uh, the corner of confusion. What's like the three? Of confusion? You saw you saw three churches. There's more than three there. Like six. and they're all within stone's throw. If you can throw a stone pretty far, well, less than twenty. I mean, it's and, not, and, it's less than, not a lot. How less many than twenty thousand? Like they're they're barely hanging on. But well, there's a lot less Mormons than there are Christians, and you've been around for a short amount of time. Touche. You know? Touche. That's true. But I mean, closed canon has not demonstrated any kind of cohesion among among Christianity. Like. It's like not, not an iota an insurance policy against wokeism. Like not at all. Well, the the people that advocate for the things you're talking about don't hold to the canon the way we're talking about. Though. That's what I'm saying. You're ascribing them a belief that if you re, if you read what they say, it's clear they do not hold what I'm talking about. So they don't of, think the scripture is the only authority. They don't think it's the final authority. So they don't think that it's closed. They don't think that it's all authoritative. They don't think any of those things that that we actually hold to. I'm not saying that everyone will be 100 percent uniform, but it certainly is a, a much stronger. Um, binding agent. I don't think there's any uh, evidence for that, though. There's okay. No well, I mean, we, so we, we would just, well, I mean, well, there is evidence that the folks who accept the things you're talking about do not hold to a closed canon in the way you're ascribing to. That all you got to do is read their journals and listen to their homilies. They only have one canon. I think that the evidence and history has clearly shown that our open canon religion is far more cohesive than any closed canon okay. Christianity. That's what I'm saying. So, like, for example, the United Church of Christ. They have these banners and signs that say God is still speaking. They don't view the only source of revelation as, as the 27 books of the New Testament, 39 books of the Old Testament. That's what I'm saying. Their well, views are not that... Protestant uh, evangelical soul scriptura views so, so, is all I'm saying. But, so, but, but there are closed canon churches who have changed, right? On same-sex marriage, not that I know of. If they there, there's definitely are who have changed in, regar in regarding like women leadership, women pastors. That's definitely true. Which I think is the right core next of to the LA what Temple. We're talking about now. Right next to the LA Temple is a gay affirming church. Yeah, and you should look up their. Look, can you give me the name? And I'd like to. And I'm not even being funny. We should look up the name. They're literally all over Los Angeles. No, I know, no, but uh, there's a reason I'm saying that. Yeah, not to test you, but to look up their doctrinal statement. <laughs> there may be a distinction within some of these smaller Christian churches, Cardin, where they are technically more open canon. Do you is think, what he's saying? Okay. But but he yeah, I'm saying say, they don't believe what we believe in that sense. Yeah. Is what I'm saying. You, you guys are sort of ascribing. Office? classic Protestant doctrine on these groups that if you read what they say, <laughs> they're not holding to inerrancy. They're infallible uh, word. They're not holding to those things. That's all I'm saying. They've, they abandoned that a long time ago. Otherwise they would never be where they're at in the most, for the most part. They don't have continuing revelation though, right? They, do they believe in some prophets? of them do? That's why I keep on quoting the, the, the United church Christ that, that says God is still speaking. Oh, so that's cool. Couldn't it, that be interpreted as uh, a, an endorsement of personal revelation, not necessarily. I, that is, I think that's their main emphasis. Canon. But the thing is, from what I've seen and heard, groups like that allow personal revelation essentially to trump 
what most people would see is relatively clear and, in scripture regarding these issues. Okay, well, I and don't know regardless about that. of that, That's fair. You, you've also said that some that do have closed yeah. canon have still done other changes. In regards to women specifically, and usually it has to do with um, their view of the Holy Spirit. So like Pentecostals, there's an emphasis on the Holy Spirit and his work. And so they would say, well, look, God can empower a woman to to do this. Why would we stop that? Whereas like a reformed person would say, look what this says. The office of elder is only open to men. Teaching authority is not to be granted to to a woman. And they would say, yeah, but, and and so there's a different emphasis, even while remaining, cur- so there's sort of a, there's an exception in a way. Like the Assemblies of God are someone like that. The and, Pentecostals tend to be that way. Yeah, so effectively there's, a closed <laughs> canon doesn't necessarily protect you from change. Neither does open canon. Well, those obviously. groups were that way in the beginning. Uh, the Pentecostals I'm talking about, well, so but it, I mean, that doesn't, no it doesn't promote, canon? it doesn't prevent you from error. I mean, Stephen Anderson would be closed can, can, canon. And I think Stephen Anderson has all kinds of error. I'm not saying we're not, that's not our claim. The claim is just that how are we supposed to approach the scripture? And then it will be, it will produce more unity than less unity. But ultimately the question is, what are we supposed to do anyway? And the idea of a living prophet heading to church, I don't believe that concept is even in the scripture. The idea of um, uh, a a Melchizedekian priesthood. (laughs) Hmm? Who who wrote the scriptures? uh, The Holy Spirit inspired holy men. First prophets? (laughs) Prophets and apostles. Okay, well, I guess my only only question to that would be, there's a lot of prophecies in the book of Revelation about what's going to happen in the end times and so on and so forth, right? Christ is going to return, for example. Well, unless he he returns as a mute, he's probably going to say something. Oh, he is. If we say the canon is closed, then would that automatically nullify his now prophetic words that he's speaking in the millennium and those two prophets that say will be killed in Jerusalem? And there's a lot of prophets in which people are going to speak prophetically, probably even quoting scripture. Are, 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 Are we keeping their future prophecies from being valid by saying, no, 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 no. We already got the Bible. It's closed. No, we wouldn't say, Jesus, you can't say nothing. I got this Bible. We would say, oh, praise God. Jesus is fulfilling this Bible. He what about the prophets that he's prophesied he's going to send before the uh, millennium? Uh, I, the two prophets you're talking about? Sure. Even I believe the, the, two, the two, prophets two prophets are simply the church speaking prophetically. But that's that's uh but the point would still be that that's not adding to the canon. Or the you know that's not creating new scripture or something like that. Or what about where it says? Um, well, then why they use the word false. prophet? I, I I am curious why why do you believe the canon is closed? Well, in the New Testament, the you have to have eyewitnesses to Christ or those who knew them. You can't just have any old person. There's a limited sort of time frame, basically. You know you don't. You don't get to keep on going forever. And the books that came after, like, for example, Philip, it's written around 250. Well, Philip was dead at 250, so it's clearly a forgery. Thomas, written around 150. Well, Thomas was dead at 150. Wait, all the Gospel manuscripts of, of the New Testament were written after the death of the author. We don't have any no, no, no. manuscripts. They were, the, the, the autographs were written in the lifetime of the witnesses. The copies of the autographs are later on, but the autographs themselves... They are written within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses. Do we have any autographs? We have no, that is not, we have no surviving manuscripts from, from the lives of the, none, zero. We, we don't, well, yeah, we don't really have, we don't really have that for anything in antiquity. So that's, that's not really how it works in general. But let me give you a great example to show you how early it was. The oldest surviving New Testament manuscript is a fragment of John 18, front and back. It's Pilate with Jesus. It's P52. It was found in a trash dump in Egypt. It's dated 125, no later than 150, as far as when it actually existed. So the Gospel of John clearly is written before a copy of the Gospel of John made it to Egypt, right? And so even just based upon P52 alone, you've got John prior to 125, which makes sense because most people have always understood John to be written around 90 or so towards the end of John's life. Correct. Something like that. So you have very early witnesses in a paper sense, and I don't just mean literal paper, but a paper sense to the man, to the, to the autographs themselves. But that's not the point. The point is that when they are written was in the, was in the lifetime of the eyewitnesses for sure. You don't get, we don't get copies in Egypt 
and one twenty five if they're not written earlier, right? One twenty four. Uh, I mean, do you do you they think were that's all long dead by one twenty five? I don't understand if it's well, long dead. I mean, maybe maybe thirty years in the case of John. But and we're, we're but we're operating from a big assumption. We have a small fragment <coughs> of a copy. We're kind of. We're, we're kind of I'm just giving you one example. Going, as if it's, well, you know. And the, the oldest we have is 30 years after the death of the author. Well, 30 years or 300 years, I don't understand. What's the difference? None of them are original documents. No, no. So the, the initial argument I gave was in relationship to what could be considered canonical in the first place. And I'm saying if the first copy of John is 90, that's within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses. If the first copy of Thomas is 150, it's not within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses. Okay, I'm talking about, about the Matthew, origination Mark, date. And Luke. What about the synoptic gospels? We don't. They are earlier than John by uh, by all accounts. They're so earlier have, than John. No, no so that's even better yet. Well, but hold on. If if you're trying to say that because we've got parchments that date within 30 years of the writer of John, that validates the book of John as acceptable to your rubric. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't fit that rubric. So how do you accept them and not reject them? Well, because they're written they're written earlier than John. So regardless of when our first copy of those are have copies, we don't have we a don't have any of that. Fragments. But we do we have, have copies. copies. We don't we have, have the autographs. No, we do not have any copies of any New Testament documents. The pre no no New Testament documents. But you mean original? Original documents. We do have all copies. copies. No, we don't have autographs. All after the deaths of the authors. Hey, let me let me see if I'm Yeah, that's true, but that's the case with every ancient document. That's not a surprise. And vocab, you're saying that you we know Matthew, Mark, and Luke are earlier than John because of the way that they are talked about, maybe within John and other manuscripts. Is that what yeah? That's with? part. That's part of the reason. But also, you have, uh, for example, remember in the earlier in the conversation, mentioned how in Paul's letter to Timothy. Paul quotes the gospel of Luke. It's in relationship to the ox uh, and the earner being worthy of the wages. And he quotes something Jesus said in Luke. So when did that happen? Well, Paul killed around 66 or so. Well, when is Timothy? Well, second Timothy is towards the end of Paul's life. First Timothy is a little bit before that. So my point is when that originally happened, you've already got some of Luke all the way during the writing of Timothy because Paul literally includes part of Luke, or you guys know might know this one better. First Corinthians eleven, it says, "Now I'm going to give you what was given to me on what Jesus said on the night he was betrayed." And then it's uh, what a lot of Protestant churches read when they take communion. You probably heard the passage First Corinthians eleven. It's Paul quoting Luke, Luke, Luke's account of the Last Supper. So clearly, when First Corinthians is written, you already had. That account, you see what I'm saying? You yeah, see so the, the process, process even internally within it. Yeah. I mean, you guys, what I'm saying here, you don't have to be decidedly against everything I say. You should want the New Testament documents to be earlier within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses. Yeah, sure. We wish so they this, were, this, but this would be apologetics valid for you guys as well. You know what I mean? Well, see, and, and you're talking, we're, we're not trying to invalidate what you're saying. We're trying to, yeah, I'm trying to understand, this. understand like, where you're coming from. I well, love, these are just arguments for the early provenance of the New Testament. Really, oh, okay. But hold on a second. I guess I'm still just struggling I, to understand I, this. So are, are you saying you accept the book of Timothy in spite of the fact Fact, you don't feel the provenance is correct or that the idea that existed in the oral history for a couple of generations before getting written down. So no, to, no, no, no. It was written within the lifetime of Paul and Timothy, Cardin. But, but we just don't have copies of those, right? Yeah. No, we do have copies, but we don't have the autograph. We don't have what Paul wrote with his own hand. What's the earliest copy we have of the book of Timothy? So all these you can look up. But I have to look them up too. Yeah, I don't. No, I, I know P fifty two, but I don't know them you to know all. This off the top it, of your but, head. No, but but the, no, but there's great websites, and that's what's so cool. Like I have a book called the Earliest New Testament Manuscripts, and it's cool. It actually shows you some of these. So you so, know what I mean? So are you like? Hold question. on, let me let me just give me a okay. second. I actually got a cup here. Okay, I, I do have a question <clears> around closed canon and open canon that I I've always wondered, and I'd love to hear your answer. Um, so. This is a cup that has all the what are called second century witnesses. So that one right there, that is P52. Uh -huh. And then the rest, now they're smaller. They're not to scale. Okay. They're not all that, that small. Yeah. But those are some of the earliest. So, you know, I see the numbers here. So we can look up one, for example. Do you see what I'm saying? Because so I have a cup with it. So let's look up P75, for example. 
<clears throat> and then you'll find, just give me a second, P75, and then you put manuscript. And what you can find that the contents are, and because of the Center for the, uh, the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, CSNTM, you can actually see a high-res version uh, online. It's beautiful. So P75 is Bottomer, and it is Luke 3, 18 to 24, 53, and then John 1 through 15. Okay. And it dates from about 175. Cool. So Very cool. You see, I'm saying they could do that with, with all these, yeah. and you can find out, you can see. So that's what okay. did you ask for Timothy? Sure. Yeah, for which did which one? How about the woman caught in adultery from John chapter eight? The Pericope adultery. Mm -hmm. Uh that is later because I don't believe you it doesn't that, exist until the fourth century. Yeah. Yeah, that is not in the original gospel of John. It's so a homeless you, text. So do you believe it? Uh, I don't believe it's I'll, I here's what I'll say. Here's the careful version. You can know John didn't write it. That doesn't mean it's not historical, but it's not part of the Gospel of John. Kind of sounds like an open canon. I mean, how do you know that though, right? Because they're all after well, because this just wasn't there. If it, it doesn't appear till later, then you can't say it's part of the Gospel well, of John. And here's the other. Later. Remember, I called it a homeless text. That's not a slur. Sometimes it appears other places in the New Testament. Well, yeah. what's, so what's later? they didn't. What's the huh? thresh, what's the threshold? So fourth century is too late. Hundred seventy five A.D. is. <clears throat> it's not. So I, I know what you're saying, but it's not just about that per se. It's when the earliest copies of any given book of the New Testament don't contain the pericope under question, there's a problem. So, so, so why I, are we talking I, I about this, though? questions oh, about this. Oh, I understood that. That's well, now it's just apologetics. Uh, I mean, it had something to do with, oh, he was saying, uh, it, had, it was kind of calling into question the <clears throat> the eyewitnesses. And I was just saying these other books like Thomas and Philip are much too later. They're not written within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses. Yeah. And there was maybe some confusion about the difference between our first copy and when the book was originally penned. Okay. okay. You know, you're yeah. right. You're right. I misunderstood that. <clears throat> I think you're right. Yeah. We, okay. we, we've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole here. I, I, the two things that I want to know when it comes to open and closed canon stuff is, um, I guess first, if you guys consider the canon of the Bible closed and the Bible itself should be sufficient, um, how do things like the Athanasian Creed fit in? Great. They are secondary standards. Okay. I that that doesn't mean Canon. anything to me. I'm sorry. Well, well I mean, I mean just, wait, wait, I hold on. That was the primary standard you used to say that I didn't qualify for salvation, was my misunderstanding. No, but the nature here's of God. no, I was saying that's why I wanted to debate it with Quaku. So what I mean by that is yeah. if if they're um if they are accurate summations of the biblical teaching on a given subject, then that makes them helpful, but they are never going to trump God's word. They're not the primary standard. But they're not authoritative in the, in the same way. They're helpful summaries so, that are found within church history, but they're not pinned, so to speak, from the Holy Spirit. So if, if someone okay. could show you from the Bible that the Athanasian Creed was incorrect in what it said about God, you would take the Bible over the Athanasian Creed? Oh, yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there's uh, okay, cool. there's places in, in, so in some cool. of the early creeds where, uh, for example, he descended into hell. The harrowing of hell. Yes. Yeah. So that's a, that's a question. Like, I don't, I believe the evidence indicates it means they're saying that he died and went to the grave. If, if it can be proven or shown that Jesus went into hell in some kind of literal sense, that'd be incorrect. I don't think it, uh, uh okay. But now, goes now, now I just got a question again. <clears throat> if a yeah. different Calvinist, that shared all your other beliefs disagreed with you on the interpretation of that scripture on the harrowing of hell, because he now no longer has a 100% same belief as you do in the gospel. He now only has a 99.9% .9 equal belief. It's in not the gospel. a gospel issue though. Is he, so that's just not a gospel issue. Yeah. So there's i uh, I'll put it colloquially. There's closed handed and then there's open handed issues. I'll put it in a colloquial way. And everyone has to do this. Otherwise, if you make those are if you well, so that's what that's that's sort of the the job of the disciple. Not that they're deciding for everybody, but that's part of what growing Isn't and maturing in the faith is. Though? Huh? <laughs> Wouldn't that well, job you're predestined be... to grow in grace and knowledge, yeah. So, so you are predestined to, to do that. So I have a question. So mm -hmm. The Apocalypse of Pilate is a document about the descent into hell, the harrowing of hell, and it and it sources from the same time as John chapter 8. 
uh, but John chapter eight, I don't, I, I never said it was biblical. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I, okay. I said it definitely was not. It, was it not definitely right. was not a uh, part of. Okay. okay. So my, do you mean, do you mean the acts of Pilate? Do you mean the acts of Pilate though? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Apocalypse of, well, it's got several names. The acts of Pilate or the gospel of Nicodemus, the descensus es infernus. Right? Well, those are all different things, I think, aren't they? Uh, different versions of the same story that Christ harrowed hell. Oh, you're saying they all contain that story. Yeah. yeah like, <clears throat> well, depending on which one you're talking about. I mean, these are things, you know, I go like early Christian and I'll look up to see. But I mean, remember, I mentioned Thomas and Peter earlier, right? The gospel of Peter, not first Peter, but naming that they were both most likely from around 150 AD. So they're relatively early, aren't they? But they're they're forgeries because they're claiming to be from Peter or Thomas when those men are dead. Because it's not our first copies at 150. Our first copy for those is much later. When they actually came into existence is around 150. Yet they would be earlier than our first witness to say the Pericope adultery, right? But when you look, you say, well, is this outside of the lifetime of the eyewitnesses? For example, in Thomas, in the case of Thomas and Philip, they have to be forgeries because Thomas and Philip were dead. So you know your stuff. You know your date. You're looking at authorship and origin. You're not, you don't think the Bible was just kind of parachuted down that's actually that's actually awesome you it know is refreshing. Well, that's yeah. great that's great so you do your research you're not afraid of, yeah. of study can I, I ask one last question are you, are you sure time I, for your question brad yeah I, okay I, there, there's just when when it comes to christ warning against false <laughs> prophets right I, mm -hmm. I feel like implicit in that warning that means that there will be true ones right Otherwise, yeah. why would he say, like, beware of false prophets if he just could say all prophets, all prophets that come after yeah. are definitely false, right? Well, I and, wouldn't. And it's by their yeah, fruits, I wouldn't, ye shall know them, right? Yeah, so, I mean, I wouldn't go to there. I would go to the fact that I think the, uh, the, that uh, you have gifts of prophecy distributed to the church according to, like, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. But I know what you're saying. So, so. I guess one of the things that I'm thinking here is your your definition of Scripture requires somebody to be a witness of Christ. And I guess what I see, when I read the Book of Mormon, I see witnesses of Christ all throughout. That is what's happening with uh, Lehi and Nephi when they first begin. They're talking about seeing Christ in a vision. And, I mean, that's as good as Paul has. He saw Christ in a vision, right? They're talking about the things, they're testifying of Jesus Christ. A lot. And if, and if the measure of Scripture is whether it's somebody who is a witness of Christ I feel like the Book of Mormon should fit within that, at least from from my perspective, and I don't know why it wouldn't. Um, and well, we're using witness, I think, there in two different ways. You're using witnesses in like someone who you know you're testifying about something regarding that person. I was, I guess, using it at least in the first instance in mm -hmm. a more technical or specific sense okay. of of someone who was eyewitness to the ministry of Christ. But I mean, using your argument, and I hear what you're saying, and I believe you're very, very sincere. I wouldn't agree, of course. I would use as a foil to that something like Surah 5 or the other places in the Quran where Muhammad is claiming certain things about Jesus that I don't think we would agree with, uh, probably neither of us with them. You know, you look at some of the things that Muhammad says about Jesus, that Jesus is speaking from the cradle, you know, that he's... um uh, doing certain things that are from the apocryphal gospels, like making birds out of clay. Not that he couldn't do that. The question is, is that something that he did as a child? You know, and you have Muhammad in 610 telling us or whatever that this is the case. Well, Book of Mormon's even later than the Quran. So I know what you're saying, but there's lots of people who say we, they witnessed the Christ in the sense that they had a dream or a vision, Paul. but that's different than walking with him. Well, the, the thing with Paul is, is, is that he also knew those who knew Jesus. So he's not, he's not way over here removed. His initial contact with Jesus that we know of Acts chapter part, 9 is with the risen Christ. But, you know, so part that, of what we that believe, seemed very real, huh? But part of what we believe here, if you'll entertain it for a second, is that Christ actually did visit the people in the Americas. That he, after his ascension, came to visit those people who were part of the scattered house of Israel, right? And that he spoke to them that there is a further record of Jesus Christ. And he taught based, like the same things to these people. And this is another witness of Jesus Christ that shows us that he died, was resurrected, rose from the grave, and triumphed over death and sin so that all of us can return to be with him and with our Father in heaven, you know? And and so 
I guess that's one of the things that I look at with this open canon versus closed canon sort of idea that we've been discussing just now is the Book of Mormon really is another testament of Jesus Christ. It is by every measure that I can use to give me what we have in the Bible, it works for the Book of Mormon as well. You know, like every valid measure that I see works for the Book of Mormon too. Because we have Christ coming in person to these people. So, but but how did it, that written record, we'll call it the Book of Mormon, how did it, how did it come to be? So f- for us who don't uh, share what you would call a testimony to that, yeah, it, it looks... It looks very dubious. So I guess if it was true, that would, but you got to understand, you know, we're talking about an angel who is from the last of this society who visits Joseph Smith at his bed, who tells him to go get golden plates with reformed Egyptian that he does out and then translates with a seer stone through a hat and then loses the pages and then rewrites it. You see what I'm saying? It seems very dubious to us. And, you know, it's from I, one I person know. who never knew Jesus. Just, it sounds dubious to us, too. I, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, part it's a crazy of, story. Well, people part say talking Joseph, donkeys I, I mean, are dubious. I, I mean, Joseph Smith did see Jesus Christ, too. And when we have in the Bible, in, in <sighs> but, Thessalonians, it says to despise not prophesying, to prove all things and hold fast that which Well, do you believe right. Muhammad's a prophet, though? Actually, <laughs> if you want to say prophet <laughs> with a little I mean, p that maybe Do you believe he's a false prophet or a true prophet? Uh, no. So, well, my reading of the Quran is that it actually starts off quite good, and then it seems to get really weird. I've, and I think somebody I rewrote studied the Quran, it. but none of us yeah. are Muslims, so I, it's like... I, I, I haven't know. studied the yeah, Quran we're not enough. Missionary. Well, I, I, feel, I was hoping you would be like, yeah, he's a false prophet. <laughs> Well, I mean, he married a six-year-old girl, okay, consummated he, at I, nine. I didn't know about that. I don't know much <laughs> yeah, about that. Yeah, Aisha, his favorite I, wife. It's, it's, it's like it's oh, like really? using, horrible. Yeah, it, it feels like using uh, like gays as a pawn here. We're kind of using Muslims as a pawn. Like, okay, uh, well, me. I could name someone else. But, uh, no, do you believe? Just, no, we're just uh, aware. Like, I don't even like it. I, I don't agree with Scientology, but sometimes I try and make sure I don't veer too cavalier about what aspects of Scientology I throw under the bus and how quickly I do it just because I I know these are people we're talking about. And I I think that, yes, it's okay to say, you know, there's things about Islam that I really liked and I I, I could view as being prophetic and necessary, especially how we got to take care of the poor and sacrifice of our own means in order to help those that are downtrodden in our society. I, I don't espouse a lot of the other things, but I also Mm -hmm. recognize some of my friends and neighbors view him as an important interlocutor between deity and man. So I, I don't want to just come out and say like, yo dog, he's a false prophet. I I view that as a little bit too loaded to be necessary. Also, I'm not a missionary of Islam. Uh, I'm, I'm generally a missionary of Christianity. So, um, we're going to come up here on on a, a break here. In fact, I, I don't know if OBS lets, I think I might have a pre-programmed section that stops it at two minutes and 30 seconds. I mean, two, two hours and 30 minutes. Yeah, that's um, right. And we're coming up on two hours and 28 seconds. So I just have one question. I, I wanted to know, you said wretched radio guy's a Calvinist, right? Todd Friel. Yeah. He's Todd reformed. Friel. Okay. Um, we just did a video on the other day where he told people they shouldn't watch the chosen because theologically it's flawed and there's a Mormon producer on it. And because the actor that plays Jesus is Catholic. And, um, he mentioned also that we don't need videos of Jesus because scripture is sufficient. And he specifically put a graphic on the screen that said sufficiency, which I believe was his second talking point that he brought up. And my question would be if sola scriptura dictates that the Bible is sufficient, then why did we need all of the creeds that came after the Bible that are the ones that crafted the doctrine of the Trinity, the nature of God that excluded me from salvation earlier and all these other misconceptions? Wouldn't they be considered superfluous and outside of scriptural sufficiency? They are outside of scripture. But when they say scriptural sufficiency, scriptural is sufficient for what? 
for salvation is what Paul tells Timothy, right? But, you know, we're not saying that Scripture teaches you how to repair a lawnmower, for example, right? So if I read a, a manual of that online, it's not. I'm not saying Scripture is insufficient for what its intended purpose is. So is or is not the Athanasian Creed and belief in what it states necessary to salvation? If what it states is accurate to scriptural data, then that's necessary. The Athanasian Creed itself written in those specific words at that specific time is not what we're saying is necessary. It's the belief behind it. Because if it's accurately summarizing biblical data, that's the issue. Do you feel there's biblical data plentiful enough that you don't need the Athanasian Creed? Um, well, so the reason why these things are developed was essentially to keep out heretics and teach Christians what proper doctrine was. I mean, that's a short version of it. That's necessary. The means by which you do that, you know, it's it, there could be different means for that. Uh, but the, the is question is... Yes or is that a no? I guess I don't... The Athanasian Creed is helpful, but it's secondary. So I believe that God in his providence uh, allowed the church to, to have these these early creeds because they helpfully elucidate the nature of the son. Okay. And that's very important. Right. And that's why some of our main disagreements with LDS theology really hinges on Christology, which, re which relates to soteriology. So my last, my last follow up to that would be, so am I disqualified from salvation due to my LDS understanding of the nature of God due to scriptural data or due to Athanasian creed um, I don't want to say dogma because that's loaded, but Athanasian right. creed interpretation. So I hope you know I've tried to answer directly. I think sometimes you feel like I haven't, but I've also tried to be kind as I can, even when I'm joking around, try to be direct. But honestly, Cardin, what it is is, yes, disqualified because the LDS concept of God constitutes idolatry. And I don't mean literally bowing down to an idol. But I mean a conception of God that is inaccurate to who he is. Yeah, but I just want to, is that according to the data in the Bible that you believe is sufficient? Or is that according yes. to the Athanasian Creed? Yeah, I believe the Bible is more than sufficient for that. I mean, just the Old Testament alone, I think, destroys the concept of God that the LDS Church officially teaches. Okay. It's like, okay. Cool. Hmm. But I mean, that's why, but that's why Joseph Smith thought the creeds were corrupt or the creeds were abomination. Well, it wasn't him that thought that it was Christ and God, technically. Well, see, that's the thing. You hinge so much on the first vision, but you got to understand, very dubious. When we look at the first vision accounts, hinged a lot on the resurrection, which the But when we look at the first vision accounts, they're so clearly developed and so clearly. I'm just going to have to say contradictory. They just don't match. Well, yeah, but and we got the handwritten about, accounts. We got clear development. Christopher Hitchens it, says that about just, the resurrection, says that about talking donkeys, says that about whales that swallowed men themselves. for three days. Well, if you wouldn't agree with Christopher Hitchens. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> no, we any, don't. That's the point. <laughs> no, yeah, I know, but it's not an answer. Do you understand? Using an atheist argument against Christianity doesn't answer your own issue. Well, really, we're just, no, the argument's bad. Saying. The point he's making is that you're using the atheist's argument. No. The, the, although, can I show you some of the differences? Wait, wait, no, how no, many no, no, people? No, no, no. How many people were Joseph Smith in the in the Grove? One. How many people wrote gospel accounts that we have? Four. So it, it makes much more sense that we have things Luke, that are mentioned in one and not mentioned in the other. Wasn't there. even eyewitness to it. Huh? Matthew wasn't a witness to the birth of Christ. But he wrote about it, the Magi coming. Nobody was there. Yeah, no, no. What, what I'm saying is how many people wrote gospel accounts in the early church? Four. So it makes difference. It makes, and they're talking to eyewitnesses. So John is, but and is also uh, Matthew God is. When to, talk about, is we're talking about the resurrection. Is that what I thought we were talking about? Here. But well, it makes well, yeah. sense because no, you no, have four I'm different saying, people, not one guy who can't keep his story well, straight. The, the only thing I'm saying is he, he was talking you, to different you audiences. Say, hold on a second, Brad. Okay. Uh, uh, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. When you say that you think Joseph Smith's story is dubious because it just doesn't seem believable, I say, okay, well, that's the exact same thing Christopher Hitchens says about the resurrection, talking donkeys, and Joan, uh, uh, sorry, Jonah. So isn't, shouldn't it be off the table amongst believing people that, oh, well, that's just ridiculous? But that's not what I'm saying. Like, notice that I got the specifics. It wasn't just sheer mockery. Well, so in relationship... Jonah and the resurrection is, in, is ridiculous. 
No, but that, that that wasn't my that wasn't my argument. I was talking about a dubious chain of custody, a dubious story. Well, so the idea the that, that there's don't have a, a that there's of of Timothy until one seventy five, uh, supposedly. That's a different uh, issue. That's just that's how just how that ancient different? ancient could, documents work could, in general. Say, that's not even specific Hitchens to Christianity. Christopher Hitchens could come in and could say, "I think it's dubious what the Book of Timothy says because the earliest fragment that we have is written 115 years later, according to carbon dating." Copied. Uh, yeah, copied 115. And they use paleography, not carbon copy, because they don't want to burn way, manuscripts. It's I'm just saying. Fifteen. Either way, it's 115 years after it was supposedly written. So I don't believe it. And I think even to get a little deeper, you well, that, no, that, hold on, but just to just to understand, birth. that's not why they don't believe it. It's because they don't believe in the supernatural. No, we, we get that, but we're it doesn't matter when the it's written. Lends itself to both. You could say the same thing about the virgin birth. You know, this is a woman who's claiming she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit and didn't cheat on her husband. There's no gospel according to Mary. There, there's no Luke. Luke contains Jesus. eyewitness accounts by Mary. You know how we know. Well, okay, well. Mary treasured these things in her heart. How would Luke know that? He talked to Mary. I, okay, th th that hope. seems like a far jump, but that's okay. <laughs> it's not a far jump. Well, hold on, the Kwaku, Kwaku. Lucy you can't Maximus just say that and discount. These, these Joseph, Kwaku, you saying, know I like you. We're the ones who set blood. that up. Hold on, Kwaku. Uh, we uh, set this uh, up. So, I like you. But, but you got to see what I'm saying. Sometimes here. you haven't studied something and you dismiss. Okay, I have studied it. So it doesn't mean I'm right about it. Let me let me tell you. I want a better. Virgin birth. Let me, my Kwaku, please. As the first vision. Kwaku, please let me. There were mockers around Joseph and Mary as there were mockers around Joseph. Kwaku, Smith. we're not even talking yeah. about that. Just don't I am always talking do about that. It's a dialogue. That's you're, what you're I, not was, listening. That's you're what just I know, but you're not things. letting me. You, the dismissive nature you have with some have of these things is unfortunate. You're the one dismissing me right now. No, I'm not. I, I made an argument that Luke talked to Mary, which is something you. I don't even know why you'd want to contradict. And I said, no. one way you know is because it says Mary treasured these things in her heart. He, he Only that. one person would experience that subjective my, experience. I took off my and it would be Mary. He, he, he I, I and so it's not a jump. You said, well, that's a jump. It's not a jump. How else would Luke have access to that information? He, he so that's all I was saying. You don't need to be okay. contradictory for no reason. I, I'm, I'm I'm trying I'm trying to clarify things here. I think there's a little misinterpretation here. This will be the last thing we do cuz both of us have to go to bed. Um all we're trying to say is we don't think it's a strong argument saying something is dubious and saying Joseph Smith's story is dubious when you turn around and say a virgin birth that the average person finds is dubious is on the table, but the first vision isn't. And hopefully you would be intellectually honest enough to understand that. Okay. I could see that why the average person might think that a resurrected person, a cured leper and a virgin birth is a little bit dubious. So I'll give some leeway to people that believe in the first vision. And don't say I haven't studied Wait, something when I have. It's, it's, important. Hold, uh, it's important. It, it is important, okay. but let me okay. finish. Would you say it's fair don't to be say, petty. Would you say it's fair to say the average American might think the concept of a virgin birth is dubious? I don't think the average American believes in the virgin birth. That's what you're asking me. No. Okay. And you say the average American probably doesn't believe in the first vision because it seems dubious, right? No, I'm not, but I'm not, the, I'm not talking about the average American. I know what you're saying, but I, I didn't layman. just say, just say by the the average, the average I, I gave specific reasons though. It has to do with the veracity of the counts. And and you have clear development and progression. Does I, you know? Can, let me. I'm trying to try and simplify <laughs> this. Does the average human on Earth? Do you think they find the average human? Do you think they find the first vision dubious or believable? I would guess the average human finds it dubious. I don't know why that's relevant. Would you? I'm just hear me out here. Would you agree that the average human on Earth? would find a virgin birth equally dubious. Yes, I think Mary herself found it hard to believe. Okay, yeah. so then maybe it should be off the table a no, dismissal Carden. of another person's belief based sheerly off the idea that it's just dubious. But Cardin, do you see why that's a bad argument? Because then you allow for anything. It's like when you, you if someone from the Heaven's Gate cult talked to you, you probably would have skepticism well, about you know, their views. And yeah, the you, believe, comment, you believe a man you know? rose from the dead. It's I, it's a little audacious to be like, I believe a man rose from the dead, but digging plates out of a hill, 
out out of the question ridiculous. No, it has to do with the, the fact old. that the one who dug plate. But I'll tell you why. Great, great question. I'm, the one who dug plates out of the hill contradicts the one who rose from the dead. Okay. Uh, oh here's the question I'm that I have. Just to, just to guys. wrap things up. Okay. Ra- to wrap things up. Vocab okay. could go all day. This dude knows his stuff. He's First off, for, baby. Dude, I have really appreciated you taking the time to talk to us like this. I Thank know it you. hasn't been easy. A long time. And I, I really, really appreciate you having the patience to sit through this and talk through this with us. Um, it, there, go ahead. Yeah. I know. I was just saying, I appreciate that. Um, I, Thank you. I, I, and you I, too. I, I have a question for you. I, because I don't know, I, I feel like ultimately God wants us all to, um, to come back to him. Right. And Maybe. when I'm looking at this I, in, in the Thessalonians that I was talking about before, it says, do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to that, which is good. Right. And reject every kind of evil. So when, when we're looking at that, I guess what I wonder, have you read the book of Mormon? Have you ever given it? I've read, no, I've read a fair chunk. I have not ever been able to finish the entire book of Mormon. Okay. Uh, Cause I, I guess the thing that I'm wondering is. Got my trusty dusty copy. Oh, hey, check you out. Nice. Check Pre-1981. Whoa. Nice Sick. work. So, so the thing that I would say is like, um, and, and this is up to you 100%. I, the same way that you read the Bible for yourself and that that's how you came to recognize God. I, I would invite you to just read the book of Mormon to do what this says in Thessalonians to test it and hold on to that, which is good and reject every kind of evil, right? If you, if you pray about it, you find that you're not inspired to follow it. That, I mean, that's. That's up to you. I, I I just, I feel like if it's kind of what the Bible asks us to do to test what prophecies are there. And Christ says, by their fruits, you shall know them. The fruits of Joseph Smith are not different accounts that he gave to different people at different times in his life, which you would expect to be different. But the fruits of Joseph Smith as a prophet include the Book of Mormon, which is another testament of Jesus Christ, testifying to the world that Jesus Christ really is the son of God. I you got know? the, I appreciate again. I believe, you know, the sincerity and authenticity and respect. I appreciate that. Um, I also got the RLDS book of Mormon. Cool. Mm. So, you know, a little different. And I bet none of you all have seen this one before. This is the church of Christ book of Mormon. I haven't seen this one. Cool. No. Well, that's what the RLDS became. Oh, no, no, these are, no, these no, folks no, are hardcore conservative. These are the temple lot. Temple lot. Yeah. Oh, the, yes, this isn't I the com- you're thinking community of Christ. I say, yes, yes, the yes. community of Christ one I've seen, yeah. and and I think some of their this this is now the community of Christ. This is yes. the temple lot. Okay. Very okay. conservative. I visited them last summer and talked to them. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, I got a bunch of their literature. Very, very interesting. They uh, don't have a high opinion of you guys. I'll just say that. Oh, none of them. Do. Oh, well, they, they don't. There's like five of them. <laughs> we own their. We own their. We own their property, so. No, you don't. They own the temple lot. They won't sell it. They're very stubborn. Yeah. Okay. And the, the, right they <laughs> they basically <laughs> seem to think you guys are like sellouts. Yeah, I would too <laughs> if I lost the game. <laughs> well, they've got the temple lot, and remember that's where Jesus is coming back. Yeah. True. And uh, true. And facts. Vocab, vocab. Facts. From, you heard it from. And Bocab. all the really, elections really... were stolen, and all the referees caused the <laughs> other team to lose, and I, all the all these big coats. I, I, I think I have real. one last question. Um, do you believe that we think you're going to hell? No. No. You think I'm gonna be in the one of the lower levels of heaven? 